Hello, I'm Alex Hetherington, and welcome to Guide London. Guide London is the website of some 600 qualified, licensed, blue badge tourist guides. Now, lockdown is easing for Londoners. People are out and about, lots and lots of people out and about on bicycles. It's been a kind of cultural change and probably one for the better. Even the Queen's out and about. She's riding too, not riding a bicycle, but was riding a pony seen in Windsor, Windsor Home Park, riding a pony. Um, it's not possible for, for the world to come to us, however much lockdown might be easing for the time being. So we're determined still to keep on taking London out to the world. We're going to continue our mission with broadcasts through June on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. And this is actually now the 10th week of our broadcasts. Hard to believe, but yes, it's true. We're broadcasting live on Facebook and on YouTube and through Twitter. So if you're watching live, then please do send in comments. We'll be, be pleased to show them up at the end and questions if you've got any. And do also share this. It's really important to us. Please do share this stream with friends and let us reach the widest possible audience. In today's broadcast, we're going to have a look at the British Library. It's an absolute treasure of, of London and of Britain. Um, uh, my colleague, Steve, Steve Fallon, I'll bring Steve in in a moment, and he's going to tell us all about the British Library, uh, an absolute treasure trove. He'll, he'll tell you it himself. Here he comes. Hello, Steve. Hello, Alex. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass you on now and, uh, and give us, give us what, what the, the British Library has got for the nation and for the world. Thank you so much, Alex. One and all, I'm Steve Fallon, a dual American and Irish citizen, resident of London for 25 years. So that explains the accent. Normally in these presentations, we ask viewers to question us at the end. I'm gonna turn the tables around this time and I'm gonna start by asking you all a question. What do you think is the most important thing you and I have in common? If you said English, you're right. Our mutual language is the tie that binds everyone listening today, whether you were rocked in a soft cradle of English or learned it at a later age. The epicenter, the capital of our shared tongue is London, where I'm sitting now. And when you do make it here, I swear it'll be like coming home. Now, if it's the capital of the English language, there must be a cathedral. And what would this cathedral be? This cathedral is the British Library. Some of the greatest treasures of the written word are held in this august institution. It is no exaggeration to say that the British Library serves as the world's collective memory. But why do people come to the British Library? Well, for all sorts of reasons, really. Researchers come to research in the, the nine reading rooms upstairs. Students to take advantage of the generous amount of desk space, free desk space and free Wi-Fi. Authors come to write or try to write the great British novel or maybe the great American one. And tourists like us today come to view the treasures on permanent display and in the wonderful special exhibitions. Entry is free to all, though to access the reading rooms, you'll need a reader's card. I come personally as a reader. Here's my card to prove it and as a fee-paying member of the British Library to attend lectures and other cultural events. I also come, naturally enough, as a blue badge guide. Now, this will be a brief introduction to one of my favorite places in the world, a space that awes and humbles me every time I enter it. I'll tell you a little bit of the backstory, a little bit of the history of how it came to be. The library's architecture, both controversial and glorious, and rich artwork both inside and out. And of course, most importantly, we'll look at the treasures and its unique collections. So starting a little bit with the history, it's very important to remember the primary role of the British Library is a legal deposit library. Simply means it is the nation's number one principal copyright library. That means it automatically receives a copy of everything published in the British Isles which includes the Republic of Ireland. Among its more than 170 million items, 
increased annually by another 3 million are historic manuscripts that date back as far as 1,500 BC, books, maps, journals, newspapers, and now even sound recordings. But most people would be very surprised to learn that the whole idea, the concept of a British library only dates back 50 years. Until 1973, it was part of the British Museum. And until 1998, it was headquartered in the British Museum's circular reading room. This is the place that welcomed people like Karl Marx, Vladimir Lenin, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Oscar Wilde, and George Orwell, all who once read and wrote here. The collection was then moved from there and from 10 other buildings in London or around London to its purpose-built home on Euston Road in North London, right next to St. Pancras train station. That move, by the way, from the British Museum to North London was no mean feat. It took four years to complete, 1994 to 1998, involved 5,600 van loads of material and 300,000 working hours the equivalent of three working lifetimes. <laughs> Yikes. Now let's talk a little bit about the architecture. The original idea for the new building was to dig up, believe it or not, dig up three hectares, that's seven acres for my American friends, three hectares of streets in Georgian Bloomsbury and erect it in front of the British Museum. But this was fiercely opposed by residents and conservationists. The architect, Colin Sinjin Wilson, the Sinjin part looks like St. John, but that's just another one of those strange little things the Brits do. They pronounce St. John like Sinjin in the name, was asked to deliver plans for a new building. But by the time it was built, it was the design was already 25 years old, which people said made it seem very, very dated. It consists, as you can see from the slide, it consists of low slung red brick terraces built from 10 million red bricks and fronts a large piazza. The building has always been a love it or hate it affair. In fact, when it first opened in 1998, after 15 long years of construction, that noted architectural critic, Prince Charles, likened it to a secret police headquarters. Hmm, okay. In contrast, its counterpart across the channel in Paris the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, François Mitterrand, was being hailed as a wonder of the modern world, with 18-story towers that looked like open books. But we here were, so, were quick to point out that while the reading rooms of the British Library were on the upper floors without, with natural light and the stacks in the basement, the reverse was true in Paris, where many of the more than 10 million books and historical do documents were shelved in the sun-drenched towers while readers sat in artificially basement halls. I'll go on to say, personally, I think the library is a masterful work of architecture. I love its vaguely Chinese elements. Look at the green tiled roofs and the round, almost moon gate-like windows. And the way it harmonizes with the red Victorian buildings of St. Pancras behind to the right, can you see them? The city fathers seem to think so too, because in 2015, the library was classified as a grade one listed building, quote, of exceptional interest for its architecture and its history. Now we go on to, to art. Um, you'll encounter important public artwork as soon as you enter the library's main gate. In the piazza, there's Sir Eduardo Palozzi's oversized statue of Sir Isaac Newton. He based this on a drawing by the poet and the painter William Blake. Close by, in a submerged poet's circle, is Anthony Gormley's stone structures called planets. There's one of them just in front of the Newton statue. Inside the museum, you'll find portraits by such diverse artists as Godfrey Nella and David Hockney, as well as a delightful tapestry titled If Not, Not based on a painting by R.B. Kataj and woven by the master weavers of the Edinburgh Tapestry Company. But everyone's favorite is just inside the front door. It's a bronze sculptor, sculpture of a chained and open book that forms a much used 
bench called Sitting on History. Now, what does it all mean? Well, according to the sculptor, Bill Woodrow, and I quote, Sitting on History, with its ball and chain, refers to the book as the captor of imagination from which we cannot escape. So now you know. But dominating the middle of the library is what I think is the most beautiful work of art. And it's functional to boot. It's called the King's Library Tower. It's a six story bronze and glass structure containing the 85,000 volume collection of King George III. This massive assortment of books was donated to the state by his son, King George IV, in 1823. Here's a second view of it from the, the, the friend's room of the, of the British Library. Love those Moongate windows. He did, did, donated in 1823, but it, is, it forms one of the foundation collections, which are the items either donated by or acquired from various luminaries. These luminaries also include the explorer and collector, Sir Hans Sloan, who was the physician to George II, father of George III, grandfather of George IV, whose, his collection of 70,000 curiosities and 50,000 books formed the nucleus of the British Library, of the British Museum, I should say, and by, by extent, the library. But many people applaud Sir Hans, for another reason altogether, he is the man credited with having invented shockless, as we know it today, by adding milk and sugar to bitter cocoa. So hats off to Sir Hans. Now we're getting closer to the real highlight of any visit to the library. Just to the left of the King's Library Tower on the upper ground floor is the dimly lit John Ritblatt Gallery. It contains the treasures of the British Library, the library's most precious and high profile documents. The collection spans almost three millennia and contains manuscripts, religious texts, maps, music scores, autographs, diaries, and more. The wealth and diversity of the material contained in just one room, one single room, ladies and gentlemen, is almost beyond description. But well, we're going to try. The gallery is divided into 10 sections, as you can see from the map on the slide, is divided into 10 sections, including everything from literature and science to maps and music. The 250 items on display here, and they do rotate, the 250 items on display include two of the four remaining copies of the Magna Carta from 1215, the charter credited with setting out the basis of human rights and liberties in English law, and so important in the writing of the US Constitution. These copies are in their own small display room on the north side of the gallery. Literature is also very well represented. Here you see the only surviving copy of the Anglo-Saxon epic Beowulf. This one dates from the 11th early 11th century, although Beowulf the epic was probably written uh, two centuries before that. Can you see the word what at the beginning? What, that's what it means, what? And also here is Shakespeare's first folio, dating from 1623, just seven years after the playwright's death. It was put together by two fellow actors, John Hemming and Henry Condell. So the likeness on the cover is probably fairly accurate. There are also manuscripts by some of Britain's best known authors, such as Lewis Carroll, who wrote the much loved and much read Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And here we see Alice being confronted by the Queen of Hearts, who Alice says, basically, oh, shut up, you're just a deck of cards. We'll also find works on display at any given time by Jane Austen, George Eliot, and Thomas Hardy. Fans of pop music, and like who isn't, will love the Beatles' handwritten lyrics, including John Lennon's self-edited In My Life, which is what we see there, 
and A Hard Day's Night, written on the back of his son Julian's birthday card. There are also original scores by Bach, Handel, Mozart, and Beethoven, and maps. Maps on display include a 13th century one of Great Britain by Matthew Paris, and a Dutch map of New York City, then New Amsterdam, of course, from the 17th century. The Rittbach Gallery, Gallery is also the repository of rare texts from most of the world's major religions, including the priceless Codex Sineticus, the first complete text of the New Testament, written in Greek, at, dating from the fourth century, the Judaic Golden Haggadah, which is the slide we see here from 1320, showing scenes from Exodus, the ninth century Buddhist Diamond Sutra in Chinese, the world's earliest printed book, and a Gutenberg Bible from 1455, the first Western book printed using movable type. Now, really, needless to say, you can't just pick up any old tome and start leafing through it, but you can do the next best thing at the British Library and in the John Rickblatt Gallery. Move up to one of the screens called Turning the Pages, and you can leaf virtually through books on the computer and zoom in for greater detail, which is a great thing when you're looking at things like illuminated manuscripts. Now, the British Library is not just a repository of thing of the written word, it also contains six and a half million recordings of the National Sound Archive. Uh, this slide just shows a special exhibit a couple of years back, um, which is no longer there, but it does hold all the recordings, including things as diverse as the first ever recording made by Thomas Edison in 1877, Nelson Mandela's spirited defense while at trial in Pretoria in 1964, and even sad to say, the warbling of a now distinct, extinct Hawaiian songbird. If you are very serious in doing research, you can go to the Rare Books and Music Reading Room to listen to historical documents, or you can pick up one of the, ha the handsets on the wall of the Ritblatt Gallery. You can also listen on the web, as you can see, to the British Library Sounds, and there's the website there, to some 6,000 recordings, everything from the earliest recording of Thomas Edison, to differences in dialect across the United Kingdom and even the US. Fascinating stuff. Um, another collection that is very, is, is, is huge and important to the library is the philatelic ex uh, collections, which is based on collections amassed in the 19th century. It now displays more than 80,000 stamps Sound, which sounds a lot, but it's only 1% of the 8 million held by the library. As you can see, the sliding racks are designed to reduce the stamps exposure to light. And I always think it's quite funny. It's, it's very fitting that, that there should be something like the philatelic collections on such prominent display since the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, is such a keen stamp collector, an interest that she inherited from her father and her grandfather. She's also responsible for keeping the Royal Philatelic Collection. Now the British Library runs some spectacular and very high profile uh, exhibitions in the Packard Gallery on the ground floor. Admission charges apply. I would highly recommend when, you, when we do leave lockdown and you do come to London, if you are interested in a particular exhibition, I would highly recommend you book early as they sell out their blockbusters. Some memorable exhibitions, recent ones, have included Harry Potter, A History of Magic, which you can see the, the poster for on the slide, marking the 20th anniversary of the first publication of the immensely popular series of books. And earlier this year, God, doesn't seem like a million years ago, but earlier this year in 2020, Buddhism took a close and well-curated look at one of the world's major religions, its philosophies and practices. In addition to the paying exhibitions. There are free exhibitions taking place at two smaller galleries within the building. They usually focus on particular authors, genre, or themes like science fiction, uh, crime fiction, that sort of thing. Um, not too long ago, the recently acquired archive of comedian and travel writer Michael Palin was put on display, which was fabulous. Now, I wouldn't be be able to call myself a proper 
blue badge guide if I didn't leave you with a few superlatives and fun facts to know and tell. So on your screen, I'll read them to you. At 112,000 square meters, the library is the largest public building constructed in the United Kingdom in the 20th century. At 24, at the same time, at 24 meters, it is also the deepest building in the country with 14 floors, nine above and five below. But because the basic basement floors are double in height, it is equivalent to a 17 story building. As I mentioned before, the library now counts more than 170 million items, of which 14 million are books and 4 million maps, increased by 3 million items annually. These sit on 625 kilometers shelves, with almost 10 kilometers more added each year. Now, were you to look at five items a day at the British Library, inspecting the, to the, the library's total collection would take you 80,000 years. Methuselah. And finally, a job I'm glad I don't have. The digital library system crawls and stores every single UK website domain annually. Uh, now, obviously, it's not possible to visit the British Library during lockdown. And I'm so sad. This picture, I just took this slide two days ago, and there it is, locked, the Temple of Learning, locked. But we can do the next best thing. We can log on to the It's Excellent website with highlights, articles about conservation, blogs, and virtual tours. So you could also get on to turning the pages on the website. And if it's historical and contemporary recordings that interest you, go to the British Library Sounds website, which is now appearing on your screen. And finally, when you do get to London and the British Library, you'll soon see that it's in a very enviable location, particularly for visitors from Europe, as it's just next door to St. Pancras International Train Station, which is served by the Eurostar from Paris and Brussels and now Amsterdam. Close by too is at King's Cross train station is the celebrated track nine and three quarters from the Harry Potter books. Catering facilities in the library include uh, King's Library Cafe and Restaurant on the first floor, a couple of coffee shops on the, on the ground and upper floors. But in my favorite, there are two excellent shops with books and gifts on the ground floor. I do a lot of my Christmas shopping there. A free cloakroom and lockers in the ground floor. The entire site is wheelchair accessible. Thank you. Steve, thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Uh, like you, I, I, it's, a, it's a treasure. I introduced the British Library earlier on saying it's a, a treasure trove, and absolutely, absolutely it is. I, in my previous life, before I was a, a tour guide, I, I was a school teacher and brought students in on trains to King's Cross Station, just a uh, hundred meters or so away. And we would go to, to visit the exhibitions. And uh, a, a word of warning, the, the, the specialist exhibitions, they don't pull their punches, they're, they're pitched high. And they've got a, the, the library has a, an exhibition team, uh, which who, who uh, exhibition education team that will take school students through and, and make some pretty high pitch stuff uh, accessible to to students of all ages, and so it's a really fantastic team. Um, Steve, uh, tell me if if you if you were going to go there for yourself rather than as a guide, what would be the the one thing that that you would want to go and pour over and examine and and enjoy being in the company of? Well, um, I, I'm a real language geek. I did linguistics in university, and still it's kind of a hobby of mine. But um, Old English is something that fascinates me, and I can I can read it sort of and so forth. And to me, still, just looking at Beowulf is just gives me kind of it makes the hair stand on the end of my, my neck. Um, a couple of years ago, well, about two years ago, there was a special exhibit called Anglo-Saxon Kingdoms, and I was like a kid in a candy shop, as we say in America. I absolutely adored it. The thing is. You know, we are a nation of pack rats here. We save things, which thank God we do. I mean, who would have thought just maybe 10 years after Beowulf was first put, it was certain written down that it would be beneficial probably to keep it for another millennium, that it might interest people a thousand years from now. We are really blessed, twice blessed, I would say. <laughs> yes, but for your reaction to Beowulf is the same as my reaction to the Magna Carta. Hairs on the back of your neck, as you, as right. you say. Um, um, I, 
Steve, we, we've got a question come in now. It's a bit bit harsh to put you on the spot here, but I'm gonna I'm gonna show the show the question here. Um, uh, do you know whether the Shakespeare statue is currently in the lobby, or have they moved that on? Is that that's a um, I actually was flipping through slides I took two years ago for another blog, and I had a picture of him. I was going to put it up. Um, a, it was out of focus, <laughs> and, B, <laughs> and B, I wasn't 100% because they did move him. They moved that tapestry, if not not, and his stature. Now, whether it's not, I think he is back, but the tapestry is on the other side of the room. We've we've had lots of comments come in, comments rather than questions. Lots of comments come in from all over the world, from... Birmingham, Birmingham, UK, Texas, USA, and all over Europe, uh, for, from Italy and Spain and France. Uh, so really, really nice to, for us to feel we've we've reached an international audience. And thank you, everybody who's who sent things in. That's that's absolutely terrific. <laughs> um, Steve, you you talked about blogging just now, and I know that you're a prolific writer, and uh, as well as a, an, an Anglo-Saxon and uh, <laughs> early <laughs> English enthusiast. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. The last thing we're gonna do now is to share um, share a screen, which is the the Guide London web page, and I've particularly chosen to share the screen, which is our our blog page, because both you and I have blogs on there at the moment. Now, for you, this is this is nothing nothing new. You're a, you're a great blogger. For me, it's a it's a novelty, and I'm really proud to have my first blog up there. Letchworth Garden oh. City, that's where I live, and Hampstead Garden Suburb, so I've written a piece on there. That, in fact, the, our, our website has lots and lots of very varied uh, blog posts from all sorts of uh, different topics and people. And here you are down the bottom right um, with, with a whole series that you've been writing for us during the lockdown uh, alongside a, a blog about Prince Harry, one of the Prince Harrys, in fact, two of the Prince <laughs> Harrys compared. And there's a there's a, a blog which which goes through all of the, the broadcasts that we've done over the last 10 weeks. Uh, although, of course, people can access them through their YouTube or their, their Facebook pages. And if I go back to our home page, just to give you a sense of how Guide London is meant to be a portal between London and the rest of the world. We have some tour descriptions, places you can visit within and around London. Uh, whether you come with a guide um, or whether you you just use this as information for yourself, there's there's lots of clues and cues and and places to to visit, and of course um, we also uh, make it very easy and accessible if you want to book a blue badge guide to take you around any particular single place or uh, on just a, a tour all over London for one or more days, then our guide match facility will allow you to do that. So I will take this out. And it'll go back to just me and you, um, Steve. What would you tell us a little bit about about where you guide and um, uh, what what kind of work you like to do? Uh, Anglo-Saxon tours, <laughs> rarity. Uh, yes, it is. Yes, so that's something I do for my own. I just was I, I was in Malden last week, the scene of the famous Battle of Malden, one of the most famous epics of the Anglo-Saxon language. But there were not a lot of other people there. Um, no, I, I I I I do what what we what we all do. I do Royal London and and all that sort of thing. But I have mostly American families who are a little bit surprised at first, and then think that maybe they are a bit lucky in that. Um, I, I see a lot of things I think in my adopted city that maybe local people wouldn't. I mean, things like we sit down uh, looking at a menu, and they'll say, "Oh God, Steve, what the hell is a Jersey Royal?" Or, why are the license plates yellow in the front and white in the back or vice versa? What are the roads all about? A, B, C, what does it all mean? Anyway, I do that. But I also, I have to say, I live in East London, uh, a traditional, not so much anymore, but a traditional working class area of, uh, and uh, of, of full of immigrants as well. I love to focus on um, multi-ethnic tours, uh, Jewish tours. And I love to talk, as much as I do about monarchs, I love to talk about our great philanthropists, which we are so proud, like the heiress Angela Burdett Coots, who gave so much money for the poor, and John Passmore Edwards, a journalist who worked so tirelessly. To, he said, I, if I provide the poor with a ladder, the poor will climb. And that's, <laughs> that's something I'd like to put across. There's a great that's finale. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. That was absolutely terrific. Loved it.
So bye-bye, everybody. Goodbye, everyone. Stay healthy and keep reading.